morning, and welcome to Falcon Spotlight. I'm your host, Rob Flores, and at this time, I'd like my guests to please introduce themselves. Hi, good morning. Thank you for inviting me. My name is Rick Miranda. I'm the Acting Vice President of Academic Affairs here at Cerritos College. Great, great. Now, um, the one thing I like to do um, when I have my guests is I like them to start off from the beginning. What was uh, K-12 like? Well, for me or for others? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, I, let me tell you a little bit. I, I grew up in Orange County, uh, kind of a split kid between Orange County and L.A. County. My dad lived in L.A., mom lived in Orange County. So most of my K-12 uh, education was in Orange County, but it was unique because uh, weekends I was able to spend a lot of time with uh, uh, the Los Angeles side of our family and uh, do homework with them and experience a lot of other cultural centers here in uh, LA. But as far as the classroom itself, K through uh, K through 12, um, I started off in um, Montessori, which is a private school, uh, the Montessori system a little bit. Um, then I went to public school right around third grade. Um, had a great experience. Uh, I always got in trouble because I was a bit too talkative. I didn't quite do the homework the way uh, faculty wanted me to at the time. There's a funny story in high school, I think it was a literature class or such, an English course. Uh, I wouldn't do most of what the teacher asked us to do for homework. I was always a little bit of contrarian that way. And she called me on it and she said, you answer all the questions in class, how come you don't turn in your assignments? Uh, well, it was boring and that kind of stuff. And so she said, all right, let me have you read. Will you read this book and write a report? And I thought I was getting over on the system. They, you know, I can do something different than the homework we're being assigned to and write on something else I really cared about. This was great. Unbeknownst to me, she just picked a different mode of teaching. And a uh, great instructor. Uh, I don't know where she is today, but I often think about trying to find her to see where she ended up in her uh, career in the uh, high school system. But she tricked me. You know, uh, she tricked me into still doing more assignments and probably more assignments than anybody else. But, you know, that really looking back, I look back and think about uh, what a great person, what a great instructor using some skill sets to be able to work with all students instead of being caught up in the same uh, one mode for every student. So uh, she was a big influence on my life, uh, thinking about what is it, what is it to... Uh, be a faculty and bring everybody up to where you needed to. You know, so K-12 through was good, you know, it's a typical student. Uh, got an A here, got a B here, got a C there. Um, didn't think I was going to uh, go uh, on to college though after, believe it or not. You know, so I spent most of my um, uh, fifth and sixth period uh, with work, work study and I would go to work. And so that was kind of my, my high school experience. And did you know right away which college you wanted to go to? No. Um, right out of high school, I went to a trade, trade tech school, um, a little bit of computer background. And then I got employed building um, um, uh, programming for databases for companies. I worked for Travelers Insurance and other companies like this, building their database of all their um, all, all their uh, clients, essentially. But while I was there, uh, they also had a branch that worked on workers' compensation. Uh, so you get hurt at work, uh, maybe some retraining, and they send you to college or send you to another program where it was hurt and get reemployed. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. I started watching this, and um, I started seeing who these counselors were. And I thought, well, I could do that. And they said, well, you need a college degree to do this. And I started looking at it and looking at it. And for me, sitting at a computer every day for eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, I went, I, I gotta find something else. So, so I went back to college. Uh, you know, it was, it was another uh, turning point, watching and looking at what other people were doing and thinking I could be a part of that. So I took some opportunities and went back to college. I didn't know where I was gonna go. I stayed close to home. I went to Fullerton College, just down the freeway. So I was a, a hornet there for a while. Um, so it was good. It's good. Cool. And did you get to uh, participate um, while you were in school in like sports or music or anything like that? Well, uh, in K through 12, I played trumpet, uh, uh, sports, played a little bit of football, uh, threw shot put and discus also for high school. 
you know, uh, I'm not big for nothing and I can uh, throw a, a heavy 15 pound ball or a discus around. Uh, so I did that, uh, choir a little bit. Um, but uh, outside of the school system itself, I played soccer for seven years. Uh, you can't tell, but I did play soccer for seven years. I played in baseball for almost nine years. Um, so I was uh, somewhat of a, I thought I was an athlete at the time, but now I don't get to practice anything anymore. Did you get to um, continue the music? Uh, yeah, I did actually. My grandfather played guitar, my dad played guitar, um, I played guitar. I played here a couple times with the Falconeers, which are, you know, uh, different employees of the district uh, coming together and uh, making some music for an event like Convocation or other events. So I I've done that. Um, while I was in college, played in a lot of college bands, college radio, um, had music on there, played um, county festivals, I was in bands. So it was fun. Cool. What did you do with the bands? Like, what, what instruments? Uh, I always play guitar. Yeah, I play guitar. You know, um, mostly rhythm, but when our lead guitarist would, would leave, I'd have to figure something out. I've always been a rhythm guitar player, I'm not, not a lead, but um, with digital technologies, you can layer a lot of different guitar parts to, to, to build on so it doesn't sound too thin. So that's the kind of stuff we did. It was fun. Cool. Was cool. fun. What were some of your favorite artists? Uh, favorite artist. Uh, believe it or not, I have to go to, I had a, uh, you have the parental influence. So, uh, my mother was always listening to, at the time, uh, big mariachi fan, my mom. Okay? So there was always mariachi music playing at home. Always. So, uh, even guitars back then in the house were things like guitarons, if you know what a guitaron is. It's like a big bass, but an acoustic bass, but with six strings typically and, and four. So, um, the guitarons are always around the house. Uh, we had a family friend who was a mariachi, a professional mariachi, he still is today, after f 40 years, playing trumpet. So, there's always trumpets around the house. So, I learned to play more the mariachi trumpet before anything else, believe it or not. Um, I can't play anymore. I'd be embarrassed to pick one up. But So influences, you know, uh, a lot of Mexican music uh, growing up uh, for my mom. And then my mom listened to a lot of uh, other music from the 60s and 70s, uh, typical what we call pop or pop then, you know, or even disco then or a little bit of folky stuff then. Then came my dad. My dad was more blues, more rock. And I remember my dad picking me up from school uh, uh, in a Ford Econoline van, the era, you know, like a 60s van, blasting when it came out brand new, the first Van Halen album. That was my dad. Uh, the first Pretenders album. Most of your listeners probably don't know who some of these bands are. Uh, the first Devo album. So this was, the, you know, back in the uh, late 70s, uh, it was the newest music coming out in my time. But that was, that was my dad. But as he got older, he, he introduced me to other stuff that I learned to appreciate. Uh, right off from the bat, you know, always the classic Rolling Stones, uh, Bob Dylan, things like that. And then, of course, uh, through high school myself, you pick up whatever's contemporary at the time. But I was always kind of um, a mix mash of music, and my friends would always say mix mash of music. Um, even today, I have probably uh, about 4,000 songs on my phone. Um, a, a mix match of uh, uh, bands, a little bit of everything. Mariachis are still there, Mexican music is still there, old rocks there, old blues, uh, all the way to techno house. Uh, I have cousins who still DJ now, not uh, just playing it but producing. So, uh, music's been a pretty big uh, part of our, our family. So, do you still get to play? No, I mean, uh, at my house, I have uh, let's see, my acoustic guitar is typically out. Uh, a bass and the bass amp is typically out and one electric and one electric amp is uh, in the house at all times. Um, my kids play and not guitar. They both have guitars but they just didn't pick it up. Um, they play clarinet and then uh, I'm going to get this wrong. They would kill me. It's like a bass clarinet. It's a big clarinet. It looks more like a um, um, more like a saxophone. You know. So they both play uh, clarinet and um, and they both sing. My oldest has been in uh, all state choir, so she competed in uh, the top 200 in the state. We've been up to uh, different events for that as well. So they're musically inclined, but my older one now is uh, moving towards more theater. So she's in um, 
community theater. Uh, she's in about four productions a year now, plus drama at school itself. So they keep me busy. Cool, cool. So uh, going back to college, um, did you get to um, partake in like clubs, student government? Um, you know, at the time, uh, yes and no. Uh, the, the, the answer, the simple answer is yes, but very limited. Uh, at the time, I was just coming back. I was still working. Um, I still had responsibilities. I paid a few bills at home. Um, my mom was very, uh, my mother was, and still is, was very adamant of, if you're not going to school, you're going to learn responsibility. Because I wasn't going to go to school right out of high school, right? Uh, I wasn't sure college was for me yet. You know, I had a little bit of growth, a little growing up. I think it really served me well to go to work for a few years before coming back. Um, so I still had bills to pay, so I worked. So I had limited time. Uh, my working, though, as I, it turned out, is I ended up always working at the college. Uh, I became a math tutor, so I worked in the tutoring center and that kind of stuff, mostly for the college. But uh, the club I was really involved with was uh, Mecha. It was a Mechista. So that was good. Tell me about it. Well, you know, at the time it was, uh, this. let's see, where were we at? This is uh, late 80s, right around 90, 91. So we're right at that cusp of the change. Um, it was a tight group of us. Uh, we had rallies. We had uh, a lot of in-service type of things, uh, community events, um, just a big awareness of who we are and that uh, uh, the Chicano life matters, you know. Um, and I still think that's uh, something that I like seeing here, that the Machisas have uh, uh, just reformed within this last academic year and really a part of the campus as well. You know, when you talk about uh, uh, the word equality versus equity, things like this, I think it's now equitable that we should be considering with what is it, what do we need. You do have to treat some groups differently uh, because uh, equitable doesn't mean that you still get two of everything and I get two of everything. Uh, that would be equitable, but, uh, you know, equal. But the equity is uh, you need two, but I might need three to make everything's on par. And I think it's important for these uh, student government and student, young student leaders to start learning the vernacular, um, being able to, what are the terms that are out there? What are people talking about? Um, I, I use the word loosely, the, the buzzwords, you know, but it's important to understand uh, every group out there and what they speak and they all have a common language, um, uh, a shared vision with groups. Uh, being able to articulate their vision is important. Articulation of uh, mission statements is probably a, a key thing for any young adult. If you can articulate and get across your meaning, uh, you will move mountains. But if you can't articulate what you're trying to do or why you're trying to do it, um, you're not going to be heard. So uh, comes back to the Machisas at the time for us. We're, we were a group, you know, that we're trying to uh, be noticed to make sure that uh, we had a voice. So it was good. You know, some students, uh, you know, for my audience, there are sometimes some students, they just go straight home and then they, they go to class and just stay home. But yeah. tell us about the benefits of uh, being involved on campus. Well, I never went straight home, it turned out. Um, uh, let's talk about employment. Um, and today's student employment. You know, if you look at our students today, most students work. Um, even back when I was a student, a lot of students worked. But it looks like today, living's a little bit more expensive than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, so uh, you get paid more than I did when I was at minimum wage of three something an hour. Yeah, that's that's how old I am. Uh, three sixty-five, I think, is what I got paid compared to the ten dollars and change now. You know, prices go up, uh, but today's students. Uh, they want a flashier car. You know, you go out to our parking lot, it's pretty nice cars. I had an old beat up Volkswagen. I had made some choices. I had a flashy car when I worked, but I sold it so I could just have no payments. Um, uh, cell phone service, that's, and cell phones, those are pretty expensive things. So uh, having that ability to work on a campus uh, s uh, saves you time. You don't have to travel and lose an hour going someplace, getting work, lose an hour, come back. Those two hours of traveling a day for a student uh, to be studying, you can't give up that time. So to stay on campus and find employment on campus, uh, I recommend that to as many students as possible. Find something as close to your school as you can so that you can spend more time uh, um, 
working on your studies. So that was kind of it for me. You know, my time on campus was in class, uh, break studying, other breaks, uh, whatever uh, events we had for Mecha, things like this. Um, a lot of events around the campus. So I really kind of uh, engrossed myself in what the campus life was and the community. It's you important. Know, sometimes working and then school, sometimes it could be stressful, just time management. So how did you uh, manage your time? Well, uh, how did I or how do I? <laughs> um, time management was, again, um, worked at school so I didn't have to be traveling. Um, believe it or not, every Saturday morning I was in the library every Saturday morning. Uh, that was part of my routine. I just said I came back to college, you know, when I was 20 or 21, and decided this is what I want to do. Uh, I had goals, and to achieve those goals, I had to make some sacrifices, like getting rid of the expensive car and such, uh, working on campus, um, so that I could spend more time on campus working on classwork and such, and some involvement, community involvement. But I also knew that every Saturday morning I was going to be dedicated to studying. I didn't sleep in. Uh, the library opened, I believe at the time, this Florida College, at 10 a.m. Um, I was at the door every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. And I would uh, find a group of students who were similar uh, or like-minded, where we would always come together and have study groups. Everybody would come together and we all knew. You know, they would float in and out. Some wouldn't be here one weekend, some another. But we were always meeting. And we would stay in there from pretty much 10 to 4 every Saturday. And that was kind of part of it and, and then go off. So I treated it like a, uh, more like a job um, and really worked on things and had a lot of study groups uh, away from campus as well. Um, so that was part of my time management. If I was going to do these other events, I was going to make sure that education was a priority and gave up sleeping in every weekend. And, you know, most of us sometimes, we always come across that one class that was like, ooh, it was real tough to get through. How did you, What was that class for you? Well, the tough class to get through. Oh, I think I had classes I was afraid to get through believe it or not, uh, or afraid to even take. But once I really walked in with an open mind, um, uh, I did well. Um, but to get to your original question, probably the toughest class for me early on was a psychology class. Okay, um, I took a psychology class at Fullerton College, and some of the concepts just weren't clicking with me right. I didn't understand why. I didn't understand how come. Uh, I couldn't, uh, for me at the time, I couldn't wrap my head around, uh, and this is incorrect, and I don't believe this today, uh, I couldn't wrap my head around uh, an emotional-based class. For me, psychology always meant emotion. But, you know, I was, I was young at the time and didn't understand what it really meant, the science behind it and the rigor um, behind it. Uh, it it's huge. And, you know, the biology of the brain and the brain chemistry, I just didn't get it at the time. But what I did do was I went across the, the walkway and said, okay, I'm going to sign up for biology class. You would think, well, if you don't get that, but I stopped into a bio class and that was it. It just clicked. Everything clicked for biology. So I just went off in the sciences ever since then. So it was biology, it was chemistry, it was mathematics. Um, and they were not, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, they were all challenging in their different ways, but uh, like anything, if you like something, you're willing to spend the time working on it. Sometimes math, that's the one that so many people, they're like, oh no. Yeah, ma math, you know, I have to be honest, math was tough. I didn't do very well in high school math. So when I did get to Fullerton College, I used uh, many of their resources. They had, kind of like we have a learning resource center, they had one there at the time. You know, so I would spend time in the tutoring center. And they had a unique setup. It was, um, uh, it was a big room with tables. You can do your homework, that little cubicles where you can be working on it. But the faculty offices were interesting. The faculty offices were ringing all around this tutoring center. Okay, They had two doors. They had a door that led into the main building, and a door when they had office hours, they would open up into the tutoring center. So they would sit in there. If you had a question, you go straight to a faculty who was in there. It was kind of a neat setup. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in there, too, with math. But, you know, I did well in math. I liked it. I always looked at math as a, a puzzle. When I looked at every math uh, concept as a puzzle, um, 
it wasn't as scary anymore. You know, but when you just think about it as this abstract concept, it's it's scary. I'm never going to get it. But, you know, I just started looking at it as I'm solving a puzzle. Everybody likes some type of puzzle or game. And I, that was really the mindset for me. Treat it like a game, treat it like a puzzle. And I got through it well enough so that I ended up being a calculus tutor while I was there as well. Yeah. Um, so probably the most strenuous time can also be midterms and finals. What was it like for you? Midterms and finals, um, uh you're going to find out in life that never changes. So whatever skill set you can develop to deal with the pressure of midterms and finals, you're going to carry that through your entire life because there's going to be pressures. Um, for me, it was long nights, long hours, um, long days. Um, I wouldn't work in the tutoring center as much as I could. I, I did have an obligation for a minimum amount of hours, so I meet that obligation. But it was everything I did was just to study and study and study and study. You know, uh, I think... For me, though, since I was goal-driven and spent every Saturday studying anyways, I mean, it didn't mean I didn't study the other six days a week, but Saturdays I was in there as well for my dedication, um, I was always prepping, always prepping. And so by the time finals came along, I did have the same pressures, um, but uh, they were a little bit different, you know, at that point in time. They weren't as as intense as they could have been if I if I hadn't been studying all along. But you know, I would also be, when I was in college, um, uh, when I was at UC, uh, they had libraries that were open till two in the morning during finals. And so I would, I also worked uh, when I was at UC, I worked in a, a research lab, for a biology research lab. So I'd go to class, go to work, come home for a couple hours, um, and then I'd have some dinner, and I was back by six, seven, or eight, back in the library till two in the morning. That's what I would do. I just did it. You know, um, it's easier when your life revolves around the campus and you spend more time on campus and you find a group of people that are similar and like-minded that can always be around campus because then you're not alone. You know, uh, you, you can do your education alone. Everybody can. But to have that peer group, somebody to... Um, understand the same pressures or and help you and help each other when both of you slip or remind each other no we shouldn't go do this we need to go study for a couple hours then we can do it you know that uh, uh, having that peer group uh, is important so tell me about the transition from a community college uh, to university well I had applied to um, let's see many campuses uh, San Luis Obispo UCLA, Irvine, and those were the main three that I was looking at. Applied to them all, and got accepted, and while I was doing this though, I had a professor at the time uh, who said, you should look at UC Riverside. I said, I don't want to go, you know, to Riverside, and he says, no, 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 what you don't understand is it's a sleeper school, and that's the term he used at the time. He said, you're going to get better ratios of student to faculty ratios, because, you know, many students leave here in our campus, they're used to um, having 20 or 30 students in a class for one faculty. You go to a UC, a big UC or a big Cal State, you're going to walk into classrooms that are going to have several hundred students to one. As a matter of fact, when I was uh, um, at UC as a graduate student, um, uh, I, was, I taught um, chemistry lab. So uh, there were 900 students in one class. Nine, it was a huge lecture hall with 900 students, one faculty, and 20 TAs, teaching, uh, uh, teaching assistants, and I was one of those. So, you know, for me, I did go to Irvine. I sat in three, 400 student lecture hall, and then when I went to UCR, walked in, it's like 20-some, 30-some people for one faculty. They said, ah, I'm going there. For me, it felt more like a community college again, at least the size and the um, individuality that I still received on the one-on-one. -on -one. So that was important to me. So that pretty much guided me towards UCR time. You know, because I, I didn't know anything about their programs, really, to say, oh, this had the best program. I was going into biology. You know, basic biology, wherever you go, you're going to get the basic biology. Then when you go, if you want to go to a master's or something else degree, then that's where you start really branching out. But for that basic degree, 
uh, everybody is going to get quality education wherever you go in California, or wherever you go in the nation, really. So for me, it wasn't about the program. It was about the filling, um, the tight-knit filling again. It just felt like a little bit larger community college at the time. So that community filling was important to me. So I went to UCR. Cool. So what are the names of your degrees? Uh, I have a bachelor's in biology, bachelor's of science in biology. Um, I left UCR and went to work for, this isn't a degree, uh, I went to work for a couple years for the U.S. Department of Ag. Um, specifically, I worked at a, a Riverside Fire Lab. We were ecologists, biologists, field biologists, working on uh, uh, issues of fire. And so we did a lot of field work, a lot of stuff like that. Uh, we worked on, I worked on plant stuff at the time. Um, populations, how they grow, when they grow, genetics, all sorts of stuff. Um, while I was there, I said, okay, I'm finally ready to go back. I went to Cal State. So I've been to community college. Now I'm at a Cal State. That's why when I talk about our system here in California, I've been through them all. Um, Cal State, uh, San Bernardino for a master's, master's of science in biology. Um, for that, it was kind of fun because you really get to start now uh, asking questions or following what you like, not just what you were told to like, you know, and how to study for. So, uh, you know, my master's was in vertebrate ecology and evolution. So in vertebrate ecology, I worked on a fish um, in the field and back in the lab in Trinidad off the coast of Venezuela. So I would do field work in Trinidad, chomping through the northern range in the forest, catching fish, doing work out there, marking letting them go and all sorts of stuff like that. It was pretty fun. Uh, it was a good time in my life. And still a great time in my life, but fond memories of being able to do field work and come back. Um, and then I was looking for a doctoral program and looked around here and there, around the nation a bit, and I ended up going back to UC Riverside again in the plant, uh, plant biology, plant sciences department and um, worked on uh, plant physiology. So I kind of melded biology with chemistry, but kind of with the understanding of physics, how things uh, move, and kind of worked in that degree. Um, I didn't finish, though. Um, uh, I have four chapters of my dissertation sitting at home, which I would like to publish, but life happens. I had kids. My major advisor left. Uh, the new advisor said they didn't like the direction she was having me go, and they wanted me to come back and do more, another year of research. By that time, I had two kids, and I was already working, and I said, I, I just can't make it back right now. And so I'm considered uh, ABD, all the dissertation. But it's all written at home. So one of my regrets, but it happens. Cool. And um, so in order to do like a program like that, where you had a, you got to travel and research, like how does that process go? Well, you know, what's important for students, uh, these processes can happen now, today, even at the community college. You have to make yourself available. You have to look around. Uh, I'm very big on talking to students and uh, commending students who are proactive in their education, uh, proactive in um, their concerns, and proactive in uh, finding an answer to their questions when things don't always go the way they feel it should. So, you know, my office, I get complaints at times. And I always commend the students who are willing to go and look at our policies and figure it out and bring it to me. So pro, being proactive is important. Uh, work in the system. Don't let the system work you, in other words. So it's real important. But understanding our system and working within the system is understanding what's available to you. So what you should do is uh, start surfing the web. Today, uh, surfing the web is incredible. Looking on the Internet for opportunities. Um, scholarship opportunities, uh, things like that. What is out there? Talking to your faculty. Uh, do they have any um, uh, opportunities for internships? Do they do anything? Like, uh, is there study abroad associated with it? These types of things. So you start just kind of experiencing life. Um, at the community college you can do this. And we, we travel. We had a group of students, um, um, our debate team and forensics and debate team, and it was in China uh, this, this last year. And I think they're planning on going to Peru. I might get that wrong this next year. So there are those opportunities. You just have to start involving yourself and asking if that's what you're interested in. But when you get into um, like the four years, when you matriculate and move to the four years, there's always other opportunities. I would, uh, my first semester quarter, 
the recorder systems that you see. Um, the, it was a vertebrate, uh, vertebrate ecology, vertebrate anatomy class. Um, and the professor at the time uh, was looking for volunteers to uh, uh, do some work in the lab. So I started volunteering, little bits here and there. And then he would look for volunteers who would go to the zoo and pick up some of these animals and do some preps and start leading teams. So it sounds horrible, kind of gross, but I'd end out in San Diego Zoo in a UC vehicle, come back with a carcass, uh, tapers, um, uh, small tapers, which are South American, uh, ungulates, uh, all sorts of stuff. I mean, you just name it, rayas, uh, ostrich, um, uh, pygmy hippos, in the back of a truck, frozen, we come back, and as a team, student-led team, and I was a student at the time, but I could lead the team, uh, getting it ready for the anatomy classes, for the vertebrate anatomy class, and prep, and all those types of things. So I started taking advantage just by raising your hand, saying, I'll volunteer. I'll volunteer. And you just start uh, uh, amassing experiences. And, you know, and then when you go into research, uh, part of your experience is if you have to go somewhere, um, there's grants. Um, some professors do have money that allow you to travel and things like this. So you just have to put yourself out there. Cool, cool. Tell me, uh, what, what was the next step after graduation? What happened? Uh, college graduation? Mm -hmm. Let's see. So, uh, as I mentioned before, finished bachelor's, went to work uh, for U.S. Department of Ag, went back. Uh, the next graduation I went straight in, after the master's, went straight into um, um, a doctoral program. But all the way through I was always teaching. I was, uh, I was teaching either a biology class, but when I got into the doctoral program I was teaching biology or chemistry, uh, those classes as well. Uh, when I finished uh, the doctoral program, well, when I left the doctoral program, I was married at the time, and my wife just uh, received her first uh, full-time professor position. So we moved up to the Central Valley, and she was professor of genetics, biology, and I arrived, and since I had so much field experience, uh, they were growing. The city was growing, and they wanted to build new homes. And to do this, you always have to have environmental uh, impact reports. Okay, so they hired me as a field biologist. I would go out there, do surveys, write reports. So I took the skill sets of uh, uh, science, of observation, uh, data analysis, writing skills, and you know, writing skills come from all of our programs here, English programs and such and uh, statistics, you know, from a math and stats program, and put them all together, I was writing reports. So that's how I started right out of uh, graduate school, uh, doing environmental impact reports. Um, but I would write most of my reports at the Cal State, where, where my wife at the time worked. And so the department chair, Department of Biology, leaned over one day, she's an office there, and called, and called me over and said, hey, do you want to teach a class for us? I said, yeah, sure. So okay. So I taught a class. Uh, and then, hey, can you teach a lab and a lecture for us next semester? Sure. Right before it started, can I give you two? Sure. So I did this for an academic year, and then the next year they said, can we give you a contract? So I was kind of a hired gun, kind of like an adjunct, uh, but it was a one-year contract for the Cal States. So I was teaching uh, biology, essentially the sciences, for a year. And right about that time, I was ready to sign another contract uh, either with biology or chemistry, both wanted me. They said, well, no, we'll take you for the contract. When the community college position came up and I applied and uh, uh, well, I, I got the position and ended up at uh, the community college as a, a professor of biology. And then what was next? Well, let's see, I was there seven and a half years. Um, pretty soon on, I started taking more of a semi-administrative roles, so uh, division chairs, uh, which would mean kind of a, kind of like our deans here, but not a, not exactly. Uh, different schools have a little bit different systems, even though they're part of the California Community College system. Different structures. Um, so I started taking on more of these administrative roles, and then we had a Title V grant, uh, Department of Education grant where I became coordinator of grants as well. So I was taking on budgetary roles, scheduling roles, uh, faculty hiring roles, types of things. Uh, many of the things our faculty do now, but I also had uh, some oversight of staff and uh, $5 million grants, 
you know, so mm -hmm. we were over that. Uh, building projects, uh, I uh, added a building, um, well, not quite a building. Um, technically, you can't build standalone buildings, so we were able to buy prefab buildings. Those qualify uh, under the rules of the grants and build up uh, another uh, lab that was needed and greenhouses. It was, it was, it was fun. It was a good time. And, but there came a day where I knew I was in a lab one time. It was a physiology lab. And um, I was excited for the students to finish what they were doing that day because I wanted to get back to my office because I had some administrative duties. That's rare for most people to hear. They're happy to go do administrative work. But uh, that's where my interests were. And I knew the next step was for me was to move into administration to really take those uh, that type of uh, role on. And so uh, started making that transition, looking around and thinking about my own skill sets, thinking if I could do it. But I had a, uh, the dean of that campus at the time did, uh, a good friend of mine told me, you are ready. You're not self-assured yet. You don't believe you are, but I've watched you grow, and you're ready for this uh, try this opportunity. So, you know, um, you jump on the uh, application circuit, and um, uh, and I had uh, a very good administration uh, take a chance with me and see that I had some potential moving forward. So I moved into uh, the Dean of Academic Affairs here at Cerritos. That was in 2012. Cool, cool. Yeah. And that's right now your current position? Or? No, so I was Dean of Academic Affairs from, let's see, January 2012 until um, last year. Um, uh, our former Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Joanna Schilling, uh, who I worked with and worked under, uh, she took another position. Uh, I think she went to Rio Hondo. And then that left her seat vacant. And uh, Dr. Fierro appointed me as the uh, Acting Vice President of Academic Affairs. So I am uh, the Vice President of Academic Affairs for now until we officially go out and do a formal search again. And what are the duties? Well, I was a bit naive. The duties were much more than I could ever imagine. Uh, even thinking that I understood, and I, I, I tell people this, 95% of the duties of the, our last vice president were probably came through my office in some form. The mechanics, how do we put this in place? We have this initiative, how do we do it? I can handle all those mechanics. But that last 5% that I didn't know what uh, Dr. Schilling did at the time now consumes about 95% of my time. Um, so the duties range, well, the duties are, are, are broad, but it really is uh, managing. You know, it truly is a management position to uh, uh, work with groups. And I don't like the word manage as much as uh, it implies that I tell people what to do because it is a team effort, uh, you know, and I'm learning to build a team. I'm learning to understand that uh, these things are done in teams for more of a participatory governance type approach. Um, so the duties are uh, working with budgets, work with the individual divisions on budgets, uh, campus budgets, uh, scheduling, uh, initiatives for adding classes, how do we do it, um, faculty roles, working with the um, Senate President and how do we support the faculty's needs uh, yet with stay within the framework of uh, law and uh, compliance uh, that we receive both from uh, both federal and uh, local legislation. So it's pretty varied, you know. Uh, in a nutshell, I tell people who ask me, I said, I help manage a campus, I help run a campus. So. And you know, for the students, you know, from our audience, unless a student is active on the campus, they may not know, uh, but, um, you know, faculty and administrators, there's a ton of meetings that, uh, you know, they play a vital role to the campus. Tell us about shared governance. Yeah, you know, uh, shared governance is complex. It's a simple concept, and it's complex. Uh, simply put, it is where all constituent groups should be come together and play a role, and uh, you sunshine any issues, you bring them through the system, they move up from um, 
bodies that will be recommending bodies to decision-making bodies and eventually to the presidents and to the board where everybody has input and was a part of a decision-making. That's easy to say, okay? That is easy to say. Uh, it's very hard to do. Um, what's very hard to do is you part of this shared or participatory governance process includes human beings and everybody has an opinion and everybody has uh, a personality and that's the real challenge um, to get everybody together and the challenge is for everybody to listen and afford everybody the opportunity to bring forth the issues that are needed and and weave all these concerns together into something that would work it's a challenge it's it's huge you know it's not only just making sure the process you you hand a piece of paper or a concept or a policy from one group to the next it's it's building that document, building that process. That's where the challenge is. And the inclusivity, you know, including everybody. You know, I make mistakes. I've made mistakes, and I'm sure I'm going to make mistakes. Uh, I'm trying to get better and making sure that I bring uh, everybody in. Uh, I can't make these. Nobody in any of these groups can make the decision on their own, and they shouldn't. And that's the challenge to get out of your own way and listen to everybody else because we can all be in a room everybody's talking the challenge is you need to learn to listen to everybody to really afford everybody the opportunity to bring what their needs are forward you know uh, but like anything in participatory governance or shared governance it's um, um, it's a product it's a it, it's a, a melding of many concepts it might not be exactly what I thought I was bringing forward in the end but I have to listen to how it works for everybody or if they bring something in, how does it reshape and reform? Because a simple concept A might end up being D by the time it's done. But, you know, you just have to make sure that everybody's uh, uh, heard. It's tough. It's tough. Yeah, I found it quite fascinating because, you know, it's like this interesting web. There's like a, there's two different categories of uh, uh, shared governance, you know, the faculty senate one and then there's mm -hmm. institutional kinds what's the difference between like the two well the senate itself is um there's something called 10 plus one where the senate uh and the faculty have a say and they should in many of the campus policies and procedures um so they have their rules that govern both of us, or we govern both of us, but they also have rules within themselves to maintain uh, the high rigor of being a professional. You know, and, and they are. Look at our faculty. You know, uh, they are amongst the best faculty. Look at our transfer rates, where they go, how many students. We're really doing a lot here at Cerritos. You know, uh, our faculty should be commended every day. You know, uh, the leadership of the faculty, though, has to be equally commended. You know, it's, it, it is tough to be a leader. It's tough to uh, hear all the comments, um, spend the time to bring it back to the shared governance process. So they have their process. They oversee, and just to mention a couple of them, uh, Senate will oversee things like the technology-based learning group. So that is a group of faculty and others on campus who come and look at what are the technologies that will help in the classroom, what's best for student learning. They oversee curriculum. Uh, curriculum is um, new courses, new programs, how it moves through the system, uh, does it meet the rigor. You know, in administration on that part, my curriculum, our role is to make sure that um, some of the mechanics are done. Does it meet the minimum requirements of contact hours? Now, they do that as well, but we're responsible when we send it up to the state and kind of process what's going on. So they have one role, the kind of the eyes and ears of what's happening on the campus, and administration has another role of how do we meet and comply with federal regulations and try to find a balance between the two. And tell us, um, you know, there's one that I think is like, I guess I would say it's like the bi the biggest one or the coordinating one, the importance Co of that one? Yeah, coordinating, uh, sh uh, coordinating committee is uh, all the other bodies, planning and budget, or enrollment management, or uh, all those things come up to coordinating. Coordinating should be the final decision, well, not a decision maker, who kind of hears um, 
and brings together all that they've heard to make a recommendation to the president and the board so they can ultimately execute something, you know. Uh, not kill it and execute, but execute as and put something into play, you know. So uh, coordinating plays a big role in that sense. So it's kind of a, a, a pyramid. So you have many committees here and they funnel up to the next level. They go through and there's a lot of checks and rechecks. Do we cover everybody? have we considered and you know that's the challenge uh, the answer often is no so okay let's bring everybody back up what do we miss so every one of these levels are looking and trying to make sure that they brought everybody back in you know we make mistakes and we fail sometimes but then we learn from those and say okay how do we do better next time and then at that point when it's cleared here then you go to the smaller eventually you're working way up way up to the pyramid so uh, you allow the president uh, and his executive board, and through him, the uh, your trustees to make decisions as well. And tell us about the role of the trustees. The role of the trustees is to help uh, govern and uh, support the initiatives of the campus. It's really. Uh, they understand what's happening in the community, what the community is looking for. Uh, they bring it back. They look at some of the initiatives we have and really are here to help support our initiatives. Uh, discussing budget, discussing policy, uh, uh, hiring, make sure we are uh, hiring the right people. Now, in the hiring, that's really done down with the rest of us. We sit on committees. You know, there are administrators, there are managers, there are... Um, all constituent groups make up uh, most hiring committees and then they recommend up so uh, but the board ultimately gets to uh, uh, bless hirings so their role is really uh, supportive and help and uh, lead us into uh, the direction we, their direction at times or through the campuses initial direction all through uh, the office of the president cool now there's also two other questions that I like to ask my guests every time um, one is, what would you like your legacy to be? Well, to be honest with you, people have heard me say this, and I've been saying this for five year plus years now. I walked onto Cerritos, and within the first few months, I said, this is home. I said, uh, this is home. Uh, I could make a career here. Unfortunately, um, uh, as you probably aware, administration, administrators, don't stay in one place too long. It seems like they move every few years, uh, three to five years, and they move. Um, and I have said all along, I want to make a career here. So my legacy, it really is very simple. Uh, I want to develop institutional knowledge and be here to provide direction and that knowledge base uh, going forward. Uh, I like to be the old sage at one point. You know, or they can come, why do we do this? It doesn't mean what I have to say is what we're going to do at that point in time, but at least understand the history of why we ended up in a position uh, that we are at that point and how do we take that next step to move forward. So, you know, kind of my legacy is uh, I want to have longevity with the campus. And then the legacy uh, on top of longevity is to be an advocate for the faculty to help really move programs through uh, working uh, in tandem with them. I want to be a bit more, uh, um, I want to work more uh, uh, kind of unifying than diversifying. Cool. cool. And the other question I ask my guests is where do you see yourself after retirement? <laughs> Um, I'm laughing because I got asked that question recently uh, by my girlfriend and my answer was I'm not retiring and the response I received back was well then uh, I plan on retiring if you're not going to um, uh, I might have to go find a new boyfriend you know it's kind of laughing about it though but you know um, I haven't really spent much time thinking about retirement to be honest um, I'm still, I think, uh, looking forward for the future and uh, being here and working here and being a part of the community college system for years to come. So I haven't really spent the time, to be honest with you. You know, everybody just thinks like, well, I like to move to, I want to buy this property. Uh, I haven't really done that yet. I, you know, uh, I hope that speaks to me. Uh, 
everybody understanding that uh, I'm not ready to leave. I'm ready to stay here and continue to work for years to come. So if I'm here five, ten years from now, and when you have your radio program somewhere else, more national, and you want to call me in and ask me, so retirement, maybe when I'm in my 50s, I'll be able to think about what it'll be like in 60s or so. So I don't know. Cool. And the other question I ask is, uh, who have been your inspirations in life? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, I have, um, uh, when I think about that, I have educational inspirations, believe it or not. Uh, Mrs. Oakland, none of you know Mrs. Oakland, a third grade. Uh, when I transitioned from private school, from the Montessori's back to public school, uh, the way the Montessori system works, it's a little more free form. It allows the student to move at their pace. If I was done with math that day, I was done, I can move. And that's very different from the structure of public school or the structure here. You know, so she was really instrumental and, and fought with me, you know, to have me do that. But I remember her to this day uh, as someone who uh, really worked with me to uh, be a good student. And then uh, Mrs. Barnes. You know, another faculty member, which was in the high schools I mentioned, the English uh, faculty, the literature faculty, who didn't uh, let me get away with whatever I wanted to and really found a different way to bring out the best of me and still learn the, uh, the material. So in high school, those were two big influences. Um, so I'm sticking my educational. Um, uh, then I had a professor, the one who gave me the job initially at uh, UC, and he, his name is uh, David Resnick, uh, he's at UCR still, and uh, he came to me and we had a little discussion after I've been working for a while, and he says, you want to do research, don't you? I said, yeah, I do. He says, okay, start reading and start writing a grant. So he's the one that started pushing me to think outside of what I see in a textbook in the classroom and then start synthesizing my own ideas from it. So uh, he was instrumental moving me forward. So those are my educational. Uh, on the personal, um, uh, my grandfather. You know, my grandfather, uh, Acta, he really took the lead in my life um, the day in and day out of the father role. Um, for me, so my my grandfather, he was a hard worker, died too young, um, <clears throat> had cancer, and uh, he he really, he's the one I look to as being that day in and day out parent for me. That was important. And then my mother, because she was a single parent, and uh, she worked for Shell Oil Company, uh, and then worked for. Rockwell as an engineer and moved her way up through Boeing as an engineer and retired from them as an engineer. And even in all the way through when she worked for the oil industry, one week was day shift, the next week was swing shift, the next week was graveyard. She did that for about 17 years. Three shifts once a month and they rotate through. And to watch what she went through to buy our house for us at that age and struggle and move through, uh, on, I can never... Uh, the struggles as a parent, what I learned from her, and the tenacity as a human being is incredible for me. And to this day, you know, she's still incredible. So those are probably my two biggies. Well, it's been great, um, you know, being involved on the campus and, you know, getting to know, you know, how the campus works and everything. You know, I myself got to experience three different shared governance committees. Yep. We shared, we're on one together. Yeah, so I got to be in uh, developmental education mm -hmm. when Dr. Brian Reese was around. Yes. And then uh, SLO committee mm -hmm. and enrollment management. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's. Uh, I remember some of your comments on enrollment management. Uh, I appreciate you were, you were uh, if I remember correctly, you're always student-centric, which is important, right? That's your role. What does this mean to the student? And not only were you always saying, what does this mean to the student, how will they impact, you also brought up, here are comments from our students. So you, you played a good role. You did exactly what you should in that when you take the, uh, a position of speaking for students, you are also uh, obligated to go back and share the message with your students and bring those messages back again. And that's forgotten sometimes in, in leadership roles. Of you are really there to uh, facilitate conversations and bring them back and forth, all comments. And I remember you, that was usually your focus of here are comments that I'm hearing. How do we address? Will this address these issues? So uh, I commend you for that. 
Thank you. Yeah, um, and it's also helped me out a lot, you know, being involved in the shared governance because afterwards, uh, I remember uh, at that time, I was trying to learn about my city because I had never known about, you know, like city council and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And so I sat in and uh, I decided to go to one meeting mm -hmm. and I asked one of the, the mayor at the time, you know, how can you get involved in the city? So he first started off with block watch and I remember mentioning it before at SLO or one of the committees and you know people were telling me about how like, oh yeah that, that also you know helps with the resume and many people don't realize you know the importance that even though you may not have like a lot of paid experience a lot of volunteer stuff really makes a difference mm -hmm. in your resume it's uh, it really speaks to your preparedness uh, you know it's that old it, it sounds like a funny saying you hear this when you're young and you're not sure you believe it but uh, chance favors a prepared mind you know, so when the chance or opportunity comes up and you have uh, prepared yourself uh, or have taken roles of leadership, uh, whether it's uh, at a small level, a level or a civil level, um, it starts showing and, and, and it's reflective pretty quick on the way you interact with others and communicate with others and bring comments uh, to city council when you get a report out and such. So, yeah, and I'm one of those geeks every now and then still, uh, I'll go home and flip on the channel and see what uh, uh, the local council, what's, what's being aired on, I don't know, channel three, you know, the channels that air those half the time, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel I really benefited from being involved in shared governance. In the end, uh, after uh, getting involved, um, my city council made me a commissioner. Oh, really? Yeah. So now I'm... Which, which city? Uh, Linwood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now I'm the Traffic, Parking, and Public Safety Commissioner, so I get to serve on that commission, so it's been pretty cool because, uh, you know, it's, I consider it an honor because when I looked at the history and I look online, some of the faces I've gotten to know, and what I've noticed is they're all senior citizens now, so mm -hmm. they had many years mm -hmm. uh, being involved with, with the city. But, you know, that, that's what's important, uh, you know, one of the goals of, uh, uh, I think one of uh, the great things about Cerritos College or any, any community colleges um, to stay in that community at times. Get those experience, share those experience, and to then bring it back to your community. You know, it's in the name. Yeah, our, you know, on paper it's transfer and, and job readiness, but you know, it, the great thing is to take those skill sets and put them back in the community in which you came from, so uh, that's great to hear. Yeah. That's a great opportunity. Congratulations. Thank you so much, and you know, it's been it's been amazing because this year, uh, for my audience listening right now, this is actually America's best public affairs program now in America right now. Yeah. Um, the intercollegiate broadcasting system has a competition once a year, and I remember in December, you know, my show got to be a finalist, and I was competing against Tennessee and a couple other uh, universities, and you know, this radio station got to you know participate in like. A cool national competition mm -hmm. so it's been great I got to be on the campus newspaper and the Noel Patriot yeah yeah and I think this uh, uh, radio I don't know if the program or the station itself won uh, an award last year as well mm -hmm. the national award as well so that's incredible yeah it's been cool it's been fun and uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, thank you for listening to America's best public affairs program and I want to thank you for taking the time to be here. It's my honor. Thank you for inviting me. Anytime you have any questions or follow up, please give me a call. And remember, uh, this is also the time where I, I plug in, you know, contact info as well. Ladies and gentlemen, you can reach me out at robert 6 at gmail.com. How can people reach you if they want to ask you a question? If they want to ask me a question, they can uh, email me here at the campus. That's ermiranda at cerritos.edu. Or you can call 562-860-2451, uh, extension 2228. That is my office. Perfect. Until next time, folks.